Hey, everybody. Thank you. Please take a seat. Thank you. Uh, I, um, I'm pretty fired up. I, I'll tell you, these, uh, it's going to be a fun 24 hours at Dream City, don't you think? So I, I got to tell you a story. I, I, I just love Luke and Angel. They're the best. The Barnetts are, are just so incredible. So, you know, there, there was some... There were some whispers, you know, President Trump might be coming back to Arizona, he might be coming back to Arizona, and just one thing led to the other, and, um, you know, we wanted to do this event, uh, trying to do something, you know, train uh, all of you on how to chase ballots and how to engage in the grassroots, and so I was talking to their team, and they were, it was all sorts of different communications going on, right, Luke? And nothing was solidified, and so I called uh, Luke and Angel when they were on their way to a service on Sunday, And I was like, hey, so can we do this? And of course, they're like, of course. Um, And just just so you understand, for those that don't know, President Trump is gonna be here tomorrow, um, which is amazing. And the credit to Joe and the entire Dream City team, uh, Joe especially, Joe deserves a round of applause. He's been, right? It's just a lot. And uh, so uh, this is, a fitting place to do that, uh, to do this, and to welcome him back to State 48. It will be a unique um, kind of format tomorrow. Uh, He'll be taking questions from all of you, and uh, I'll tell you, this will be his first public event post-show trial conviction, and I can't wait to show the world that Arizona stands with President Trump, so uh, show up early tomorrow. I believe time the doors open, 9 or 10? 10? Um, and let's show the grace of Jesus Christ when there's long lines, delays, and government workers that are not working fast enough. Uh, we have done 15 or 20 of these, and they never go quickly. Uh, I would say sometimes they go smoothish, but uh, it's just going to be fun. Uh, and who here plans to sh- show up tomorrow? Who's, who's, who's showing? That's awesome. So can't wait to see all of you there. It's going to be amazing. And uh, President Trump will be right here, and we're going to be giving some remarks there. Um, and I want to show that QR code, by the way. If you want to uh, register ahead of time and you are not yet registered, um, there should be a QR code somewhere that we can um, throw up there. And then I want to make one, uh, one, one more announcement, and then we'll welcome up Ali B. Stuckey. Let me see. If not, we can um, get that up there. So today is also a pretty amazing day. And I'll tell you, the next uh, 10 days at Turning Point are... Or, or something. Tonight we have Freedom Night. Tomorrow we have President Trump. Um, and then this weekend we have our Young Women's Leadership Summit uh, in San Antonio, Texas. Over 2,000 young women leaders uh, from across the country. Oh, there it is. Uh, you guys can stand. If you're not yet registered for the event tomorrow, um, I want to just be very clear. This does not guarantee you entry, but it does allow us to know who is coming and who is not coming, and you are going to need to register to vote. So, um, to, 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 and you need to register to vote too, but register. <laughs> register to show up, so um, to attend. So that, that is the QR code there. So this weekend, we have our Young Women's Leadership Summit in San Antonio, Texas. Next weekend in Detroit, Michigan, uh, we're hosting the president again at the People's Convention. Uh, we also have our Chapter Leadership Summit and our Blexit event. So it's a crazy 10 days uh, at Turning Point. Uh, but today is a very special day. And I want to just kind of take you back through memory lane. Uh, this is June 5th, 2024. On June 5th, 2012, I had the crazy and wild idea as I was driving home from Rockford, Illinois. I, there's a lot of things went into this and I said, that's it. I wanna try to start a youth organization to try and save Western civilization. You know, small things that most 18 year olds wanna do. And exactly 12 years ago from today, Turning Point USA was born. And so today is the 12 year anniversary of Turning Point USA. And it's pretty awesome. And well, I'm gonna show you some pictures here. So we're celebrating 12 years today, and the story is a only in America God story. Glory be to God for his grace and his kindness and his goodness. Uh, Because remember the context of where uh, Turning Point started. 12 years ago, millennials were supposed to be the most progressive, left-wing, Marxist generation in history. There was no sizable youth movement in America. There was a little bit here and a little bit there. And just, by the way, we are now coming up on, do you know that it's three years we've been doing Freedom Night in America? Can you believe that? This is, is, that, this is three years now. Let's just take this event. Just this event alone shows the impact 
of how God is using Dream City Church, using TPUSA Faith, using Turning Point USA. And so I never could have imagined what would happen. And so I think we have a picture of the original garage where Turning Point USA was started. Um, so we started in a garage at 217 and a half Illinois Street. There it is. Um, and it looks much nicer than it used to. Uh, so the way I, I say it is that Apple, HP, and Turning Point USA all started in garages. Only in America success stories. And it has just been this remarkable journey where we started with no money, no connections, no idea what we were doing. We now have over a thousand high school chapters across the country, over 800 college chapters across the country. We are, I really believe the Lord has blessed this movement over the last 12 years to lead us to this year, uh, to lead us to what is in front of us where the stakes have never been higher. And I could go through all the successes and all the wins, but I just wanna say thank you for those of you that pray for Turning Point USA, for those of you that support Turning Point USA, for those of you that volunteer for Turning Point USA, for those of you that start chapters and run them for Turning Point USA, when you are 15 years old and you start a high school chapter and you're called all these bad names, I just wanna say thank you. You are appreciated more than I can ever put into words. And what started 12 years ago on a drive back from Rockford, Illinois, where I came up with this idea of, we'll call it Turning Point. Now 12 years later, we are now the largest organization in the conservative movement hosting President Trump twice in one week. And it's just only in America is a story like that possible. So, and only thanks to the blessing of the Lord. And it came out of the grassroots of this country as a response to the secular godless totalitarianism that we see reigning over our country. And so it really has just been my great honor to start it. And the credit really also goes to the Turning Point USA staff and the people that run it every day. I wish I could take credit for it, but they work so hard, they're in the grassroots, and you're gonna see that on display tomorrow. So, happy birthday, Turning Point USA. Praise God. So, we have a very, very special guest tonight. Um, I've known Allie for probably five or six years. Uh, Allie is one of the most important voices in the Christian community and definitely the Christian conservative community. You know, she has an amazingly successful podcast. It's called Relatable, right? Is it, am I right? I, I, I don't listen to every episode, but I listen to it frequently. And what I love about Allie's approach is that I will say almost the same thing that Allie says. She just said it so much sweeter than I do. And I'll listen to it, I'm like, yeah, I probably could have said it like that, probably could have said it like that. Yeah, I mean, you know my style, right? We don't really, um, cushion things very much, we're straight to the point. Uh, but it's not that Allie cushions it, it's just that she has an amazingly godly way of communicating hard truths and biblical truths. In a world where young ladies are lacking role models, she is a godly role model, a mother, a wife, someone who understands the scriptures very well, and somebody that we're just honored to partner with. She's gonna be speaking at our Women's Summit uh, at Turning Point USA this weekend. Um, she is very, very gifted and not afraid to bring the heat against this broken culture. So join me in welcoming Allie Beth Stuckey. Hello, thank you so much. We're getting an extra mic. So I'm just gonna fill that window. Thank you so much for having me. This is my first time to Dream City, and so thank you so much for that warm welcome. This is really an exciting week. YWLS, the first time I spoke at YWLS, I think was 2018. It was a lot smaller than it is now, and oh my goodness, it's grown. Every time I speak, I always say, this is my favorite event ever, just because of the energy of all the women there. And it's very unique because uh, we say biological females only, because that's the only type of female there is. Yeah, we have to qualify that these days, yep. And uh, anyway, you'll be able to watch it online. Uh, again, nearly 2,000 young women from across the country will be gathering in San Antonio, Texas this weekend. It's a remarkable thing, all becoming force multipliers. Allie, why don't you just take a second, introduce yourself, um, the, you know, the, the books you've written, uh, your podcast, just introduce yourself to the audience. 
Sure, so my name is Ali Stuckey, and I am a wife and a mom of three girls, so that's more important, or most important, underneath my relationship with Jesus Christ, and my desire to make him known, is my vocation as a wife and mom. But then also, I host this podcast called Relatable, good job getting the title of that right, Charlie, <laughs> um, where we analyze news culture, politics, theology from a Christian conservative perspective, and I talk to mostly women ages 25 to 45 about the importance of building a biblical worldview. And the reason I did it, it was not the exact same story as Charlie's when he thought of Turning Point, but it was a little similar in that I was driving one day and I just realized, oh, this is a big problem. Not 2012, this was probably 2016. I was living in a pretty conservative college town in Athens, Georgia, used to be conservative, and I was looking around and thinking, all of these young women who claim to be Christian, who were raised in these solid homes, this was, of course, the election of Trump and Hillary Clinton, and they did not know anything that was at stake in the election. They didn't know who they were going to vote for. I was leading a Bible study at the time. I was a year out of college. I was leading a freshman Bible study. One of the sweet girls in my Bible study who was so smart, she told me that she loved Bernie Sanders. And that is when I realized, okay, we've got some work to do. Um, and so I speak, to, I speak to mostly Christian women. And by the way, she is a wife, mom, Trump voting, conservative Republican today, thankfully, by the grace of God. But... Um, Anyway, and so that's why I started to do what I do now. I'm speaking to mostly Christian women. Okay, what does the Bible say about these issues? How do we approach these very controversial topics today that honestly most Christian female leaders are really wishy-washy, really mushy, really weak on? What does the Bible say about these things? And of course, I'm not the perfect arbiter of what the Bible says about everything, But my goal is to help us do our best in building our worldview on Scripture. So that's basically my mission. And uh, Allie is one of our most requested speakers at Turning Point USA. And we did a campus event together in Auburn. And I think that clip has been seen like 50 or 60 million times where a young lady came up and asked me, where's my criminology degree or something? It was quite uh, quite an interaction. Allie, let's dive right into it. So... Frequently, you'll hear that there's a crisis of masculinity in America. Do you think that there is a crisis equally as much of femininity? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And of course, they look different. And I think it really goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. We're seeing that reflected in the West today, or maybe just in the world today. When you look back at Adam's sin, the sin of passivity, when he stood there as Eve listened to the serpent and took the bite that she shouldn't have taken, and then Eve hearing and being tempted to be convinced by the question, did God really say? And I still see that manifesting itself today among men and women women being tempted by this very deceptive and cunning question, but did God really say? Um, Did God really say on the issue of marriage or on the issue of gender, on the issue of gender roles, whatever it is that the culture today deems controversial, did God really say? I like to say that women, I don't like to say it, but I do say it, that women are typically tempted by something that I call toxic empathy. Because we are feelings-based, because we have sympathy and have empathy for those who are on the margins and we really want to build relationships, we very often can confuse empathy for love. And we very often can obscure the truth just because we want to affirm how someone feels. And that gets a lot of women, even Christian women, in very unbiblical territory when it comes to social justice, when it comes to LGBTQ, when it comes to all kinds of issues that women have a lot of maybe rightful feelings about, but our feelings cannot 
obscure what the word of God says about these things. And so I try to navigate that as much as I can. So the, the idea of male and female differences, that's a distinction that is fundamental to any society, which is one of the reasons why Satan tries to obscure those differences. Those differences are beautiful and those distinctions are necessary for us to be able to live in a free society and live in a civil society. And we're seeing those eradicated on a daily basis. I'm, I, I got in a lot of trouble recently when I said, you might remember, and you defended me, by the way, very nicely on social media, yes. where I, and I, I didn't say it as politely as Ali would have said it, but I said, young ladies, be careful uh, prioritizing career over family formation because you might end up in your early 30s with a career but no family and lots of cats. I got in a lot of trouble for saying that. I don't care. So why... T talk broadly yeah. about that. There is a trend, and you, you, see, you just mentioned this, the most left-wing cohort in America are not black voters, they're not Hispanic voters, they are single, unmarried, career, college-educated young ladies living in the urban cities of this country that have made a conscious decision over a period of 10 or 15 years to not get into serious relationships and not prioritize family formation. formation. Talk about that. Yes, many of those women have made that conscious decision. They decided or they bought into this lie that has been propagated by the media that you can become a mom whenever. You can get married whenever. And really right now, you just need to focus on you. You need to find yourself. You need to learn how to love yourself first. If you don't fully know yourself and love yourself and discover yourself and fulfill and empower yourself, then you'll never be able to be a good wife and mom and have other good relationships. Well, what happens when you believe that lie, because it's not, it's not true, this whole thing that you can't love other people until you perfectly love yourself, I think that's actually a lie from the pit of hell that Satan uses to defer us from loving other people because we'll never perfectly love ourselves. And by the way, we're not even called to focus on loving ourselves at all. That's an aside. But women, we believe this self-empowerment talk because it sounds good. And so you believe that you can defer motherhood. And in an age when we think that biology is arbitrary, the biology of male and female, but also the biology of reproduction and the female body, it sounds really convincing. And then, like Charlie said, I may or may not have included cats as I was talking about this, but it's a fair point. Um, a, a, lot of, a lot of women end up realizing, oh, I didn't realize that this would be so difficult at this point. I didn't realize that I wouldn't be able to find a man right away or get pregnant very easily just because that's how female you know, biology tends to work. Now I will say, and this is what I also said, on my show because I have beautiful, godly, single, 30-something friends who are doing all the right things. Who, yes, they have a career because what were they supposed to do? But they've been going to church, they've been serving, they've been trying to meet the right guy, they just haven't met the right person. And so I do also, I always wanna give encouragement to that woman who feels like, oh my gosh, I've tried to do everything right and I haven't met the man that I'm gonna marry, and then they feel like, oh, Charlie Kirk thinks I'm a cat lady, and I'm not. Um, I, I do wanna speak to that woman because I have friends like that that are beautiful, godly women and total catches, and they just haven't found the right person, is that God can use you fully right now where you are, no matter your relationship status and no matter whether you have children, is that your life doesn't your life doesn't start at that point. You're not in a holding pattern. You're not in some kind of earthly purgatory. You're not useless to the kingdom of God just because of your relationship status. Satan wants you to think that you're not a full woman or you're not a full Christian until X, Y, Z happens. And that is a lie that will steal your joy and that will steal your usefulness for the kingdom of God. And so it's not a guarantee, one, that we're gonna get married. It's not a guarantee that we'll have children, hopefully. I mean, that's what people hope for. But I just want you to know that if you want those things, God has like, given you those things yet you're being you know placed in the right spot to try to have those things one day 
that you are still fully capable of being used by God right now. That's beautiful, I, I totally agree. I wanna isolate something which tends to be more a female-driven Eastern focus or emphasis, mm -hmm. which is self-love. Mm -hmm. So what is self-love? And when I, I sometimes hear Christians tell me that we need more self-love, yeah. and I, I would love to like find the Bible verse, like I mean, I guess it says love your neighbor as yourself, that, but that's not exactly, I mean, we're supposed to love Jesus and love God. I mean, it says in Deuteronomy 6, 6 3 and 5, love the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Is self-love biblical? Yeah, you know, the only time we see this term self-love is when we are uh, reading the description of the evils of the end times. In the end times, people will be lovers of self. And today we hear, oh, no, 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 that's basically gospel, that uh, love your neighbor as yourself is also a command to love yourself. No, 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 that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying love your neighbor as yourself because loving yourself is a given. No man ever hated his own flesh but cherishes it. Now, does that mean that we always like ourselves? No, we don't always like ourselves. We don't always like what we see when we look in the mirror. Maybe we regret something that we did or we wish we could change something about our personalities or our capabilities. But we love ourselves innately in that we are always seeking to satisfy our own needs and wants, to quench our own thirst, to satisfy our own hunger. So in that way that you so naturally seek to meet your own needs, Jesus is saying, seek to meet the needs of other people. He's not talking about affection. He's not talking about liking your neighbor or liking yourself. He is talking about a sacrificial kind of love that we already very naturally feel for ourselves. We do not have a deficit of self-love in this country. Oh my goodness, we do not have a deficit of self-love. We have an overflowing of self-love. We think about ourselves way too much. We love ourselves way too much. I saw an awful statistic on X today about how suicide rates are climbing and they're so much higher than they were just 10 years ago. And it's so interesting because we have more self-love talk, more self-empowerment talk, less shame, less stigma, more tolerance, more acceptance of everything, and still we have this pandemic of despair. I mean, to me, it seems obvious that despair has gone up as godlessness has gone up, right? That as godlessness has increased, people have lost their joy, they've lost their purpose, they've lost their community, they've lost their hope, they've lost their faith in something bigger than themselves. And when the God of scripture is no longer on the throne, then we put the God of self on the throne and the God of self is a cruel God. And it leads to the kind of despair and discouragement that we're seeing today. So no, we don't need more self-love. We need a lot more of God's love, which looks very different. And uh, th this is so important. If you go into almost any public school here in Scottsdale or around the country, self-love is the state-run religion of K through 12 education. Well, also paganism, environmental worship, anti-racism, transgenderism, grooming, those are state-run religions too. But self-love is the one that Christians fall for far too often. And here is the, Ali, you, you said it perfectly. You would think that when a society starts to love themselves more, then let's just say actions of despair, suicide, drug overdosing, aimlessness, checking out of society, would go down. So as we have prioritized self-esteem or self-love, and we've de-emphasized self-control, big difference, yeah. we have seen the West collapse. Because when you have self-love, you're thinking about yourself all the time. Dare I, I think you would agree, Ali, it is narcissistic at its core. I'm the most important thing in the world, so I'm gonna go give myself a metaphorical hug and. Who cares if I keep on smoking weed or watching pornography because I have to love myself. No, the West was built on the biblical idea of duty and obligation, of what I ought to do. And when you start thinking about the divine and others more than you think about yourself, you're actually happier. When you think about yourself all the time, you will torment yourself into 
just basically into a corner. You, you can't, a human being can't survive like that. Why do you think Christians have been, become so susceptible to this? Where does that come from? Because every so often I'll hear a pastor or two kind of spite, you know, add in a little bit of a self-love thing and just take a moment and think about yourself or you can do it if you put your mind to it. Where does that come from? Yeah, I guess it's a form of therapeutic Christianity. Um, and the therapy world is very influenced by new age philosophy. And I see this a lot among Christian women um, reading books that are really more new age. And the idea goes like, like this, that we are all on a journey to find ourselves and that inside we have this beautiful goddess that's really perfect. And if we throw off all societal expectations, toxic relationships, people's unfair standards, religion, rules, all of that, then we'll unleash this perfect goddess inside of ourselves and everything that we've ever wanted will finally become ours and we'll finally be happy and fulfilled. Every single teacher, every single author I know that has pushed that message behind her is broken relationships, broken friendships, a lot of deceit, and simply a lot of sadness. That is not the journey that the Christian is on. In scripture, when we see self-something else, it's never self-empowerment or self-sufficiency, it's self-denial, it's self-control. So we already know that unleashed, we love ourselves a lot. And what that self-love looks like is giving in to every feeling and want that I have. And I mean, we can look at any human being, we can look at all of history, we can look at any toddler that we see running around and we see the terror that it looks like when someone is only concerned with what they want in any given moment. So yeah, to answer your question, I think it's new age therapy that has woven itself into Christianity and they think telling people that feeling better about yourself is the same thing as the gospel, and it's not. And I, 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 I compare it to, I think an entire generation has effectively lived the metaphorical King Solomon life, mm. meaning they've done everything they wanna do, they've had every earthly treasure imaginable. And I encourage you guys just to open up the first couple of verses of Ecclesiastes. You, you, you'll think you're reading like a 16-year-old suicide note. I'm not kidding. He starts with worthless, meaningless, meaningless. All in the world is meaningless. You're like, is this some sort of punk rock song or yeah, something? I was about to say that. And essentially, no, it's King Solomon who goes on and on about how everything, nothing has any meaning and it's all terrible and awful. Now the book ends actually in a much better place because he says it actually has meaning thanks to God. But understand the context. This is King Solomon who had everything you could possibly imagine. As Jesus says, even Solomon in all of his splendor would not be clothed. It, it, the idea of Solomon's riches is beyond anything you imagine. Anything the flesh desired Solomon ha had. As many wives as he would want, as many robes as you want, as much land, as territory, conquering people at his beckoning call, and the guy is writing, I'm just, I'm, nothing matters. Everything is meaningless. And again, I, the whole generation has effectively lived that life, yeah. which is hedonism at its core, pleasure first above all, I will worship myself and I will not die to myself for Christ. And we're seeing the, the um, ramifications of that. Ali, our job is hard because our job is to tell a broken culture to basically repent from their vices and to go through a chapter that might be uncomfortable, but it's actually better for them. It's trying to get a country to take the metaphorical cough medicine, essentially. And the church is supposed to be the one issuing that correction to the error. How do we best do that? And I don't think I do it the best. I just know that I can, I, I'm more on the truth side than on the, the love and truth side. Um, Me too. And I just, how do we best correct a broken culture without running the risk of being, let's just say, credibly accused of being legalistic or too harsh. By credibly, I mean outside of the nonsensical fake Christians that 
that issue those criticisms towards us. Yeah, you know what you said reminded me of something, and we see a lot of videos of deconstruction. I'm sure y'all have heard of ex-evangelicals or the deconstruction movement, and especially in the month of June. Uh, Happy Pride Month, everybody. Actually, it's it's Noahic Covenant Month. That's why everyone has the rainbows around, right? Oh, We're celebrating funny. God's promise. Happy Sodom and Gomorrah Month is what we. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So it, it made me think of something because I, whenever I hear uh, the deconstruction testimonies of people who say, oh, I know everything that you guys believe because I was raised believing that too and now I'm so much smarter on the other side because I don't believe it. They'll say things, it usually has to do with their sexual sin and they wanted to give in to their sexual sin or their friend's sexual sin and they didn't want to tell their friend that they're in sin. And they'll say something like, you know, I tried to repent of that or I tried to pray away that struggle, or I tried you know, being holy and I just couldn't do it. And I'm like, oh, someone along, someone along the way of your faith told you that it was gonna be easy. Someone told you that this sanctification business was gonna be fun all the time. Someone told you that we would just be able to pray our struggles away and they'd be gone the next day and that's what the Christian life was going to look like. No one ever told you that self-denial is gonna be hard from here until glory. And so a lot of the deconstruction movement, I think, is actually because of unfair expectations that are placed on them by pastors who say that Christianity is all about just being happy and loving yourself. When it's not, we get something so much better through Christ. We get liberation from our sin and of course, freedom from sin and sorrow forever and ever in heaven with him. But now I'm forgetting what your, what your question was because I went on my aside. What, what did you ask? I, I can't remember either. So, um, okay. It was something, I, I interjected about Pride oh, Month. How do, we, how do we speak the truth in? Oh, that's in right. No, 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 no. Now, now I'm remembering. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I, I was saying that how do we credibly, how do we speak the truth without credibly being accused of being too harsh, yeah. too legalistic? Yeah. Again, I, I try to do that balance. I think I end up getting a little bit too in the truth side. But I mean, let's just give an example. Yeah. I mean, a young lady, you know, comes up to you and at a college event, she says that she's a practicing lesbian or what, you know, whatever. How do we navigate? All of us have those conversations. All of us have those friends. How do we be love and truth, truth and grace as Christ was, both those things? Yeah, so I recently had the opportunity. I don't always have this opportunity. I don't go on college campuses in the same way that you do and have those interactions with people I disagree with every day. But I had this almost three hour debate on another podcast with a teacher who calls himself, of course, this is not something that's real, but he calls himself non-binary. And he has a very large TikTok platform. He is a teacher of, I think, middle school students, and he's always talking about these things. He has his degree in statistics from Dartmouth. He went to Johns Hopkins for his education degree. So he really felt like he brought a lot to the table when we were debating gender ideology. And I had the opportunity to really minister to him in that conversation without backing down at all. I mean, I did not back down one centimeter, not even a little bit, because... The truth is so obvious and it's so easy. And I did not have to give credence to anything he said. But when he told me, which was not surprising at all, that he was raised by two women, that he had no dad in his life and really no father figure at all, and that he was very confused by the time he was a teenager and he felt like he was in the wrong body, it was that moment that I got to say, I bet that was so hard. I bet that felt really terrible to feel like you aren't in the right place, to feel misplaced in your own self. I bet that was hard. But that's where you can stop. You do not have to go beyond that and then affirm their feelings. I bet that was really hard, but God made you a man. I bet that was really hard but we all have struggles and we all believe lies and we're all uncomfortable in this life and in our bodies. And God sent his only son to free us from those lies and the burden of sin. That is the good news. That's the good news. Not that you get to stay in your sin, 
No, Jesus said that his burden is light and his yoke is easy. The burden of sin is heavy. The yoke of sin is really hard. And if we believe that, if we believe the gospel, then the most loving thing that we can always do is agree with God. It's the most loving thing we can always do. And will you still get people who are mad at you? Will you still get people who say, oh, you're mean, you're a bigot? Of course, they crucified Jesus. Do we think that we're gonna be let off the hook? I mean, when you look at, for example, Stephen, he was full of grace and truth. Jesus, full of grace and power. Stephen, full of grace and truth. I think I didn't switch those up, but it's basically the same principle. Stephen, he stood there and he just shared the gospel to those men. What happened to Stephen? Did they accept him? Did he get to write an op-ed in the New York Times? He was stoned to death. And so we cannot judge our obedience by people's reaction to us. So Allie, I wanna just cover one more thing here, then we'll do some questions. Uh, it is, uh, remember, pride is a sin, and uh, an entire month dedicated to pride probably is a piece of evidence that your culture is falling apart, let's just be honest. And I, I wanna say this as fairly as one can say it, that Jordan Peterson, his credit, had a great clip on this. I wanna make sure I give him credit because he hasn't spoke out about this in the past. If you have reduced your entire identity to your sexual behavior and that is who you identify as, that, that is a, that, that, how do I say this? Um, that is a very, um, that, that is not the best way that you should present yourself to the world and nor should we accept that from people that we truly love. That's the best way I can say it, is that if your sexual behavior is the most important thing to you, that's really weird. Let's just be honest. That, that, that's the most important thing, not your character, not how you treat other people, not your relationship with the divine, not, not the things that actually matter. And remember, before the fall is pride. Pride goeth before the fall and before destruction. So it is Pride Month. Um, it's so interesting. So we have a 21-month-old. We just welcomed a baby boy, by the way, three weeks ago. Praise God. And so Allie and I both, uh, we are now card-carrying members of two under two, which I'm told is uh, you get extra points for that. We're enjoying every minute of it. And uh, so the... It's so interesting, we, we try to not watch a lot of TV, but every so often, you know, you try to turn on a kid's program for 20 minutes or something, and there is this really creepy woman that pops up on your YouTube well before this stuff, Miss Rachel? What a weird person this is. And I never liked her, and I was like, she's never allowed on my TV. There's like, there's something wrong, like total groomer vibes, like big eyes, like very strange. Do you know who I'm talking about, anybody? Um, I think she's a total psyop from something. And what happened this last week, Allie? With Miss Rachel. Oh, see, I probably wouldn't have described her in that way. But to be fair, to be fair, a lot of people agree with Charlie. Uh, my kids. Um, she has these bug eyes, and she's like very weird. Okay, I don't know Miss Rachel personally. We've also never watched Miss Rachel. The difference in, in, in my home, but she does seem. This, but this is where it gets dangerous. She does seem very sincere and very sweet. And she, a couple years ago, and I talked about it on my podcast at the time, and people freaked out about it because she invited Dylan Mulvaney, the grown man who calls himself a girl and got famous from dressing up basically like a six-year-old girl on TikTok. Uh, she invited him on her show. That collaboration hasn't happened yet. She also had someone who was presenting herself as going by they, them, and inviting the young audience to drag shows in Chicago. But her videos were still about speech. They were about ABC, so 10 million subscribers on YouTube. Extremely popular Huge. even among you know, Christian women, millions of followers on Instagram. Well, this month, she gives a special pride message saying, happy pride. If you don't want to follow me, I don't really care. God bless, go your own way, but I'm gonna celebrate pride. She follows back up saying, the reason I celebrate pride, she says, is because of my Christian faith. Because Jesus tells me to love my neighbor as myself and there are no exceptions. Um, and so, Miss Rachel, as sincere and as sweet as I think that she probably is, she confuses 
She confuses love, biblical love, with that toxic empathy. Toxic empathy says, because I can feel what you feel, I have to affirm what you feel is good. And that's not the love of God. The great news is, here's great news, is that we cannot outlove God. God is love, 1 John 4 and 1. God is love. That means love is not love. God is love. And in 1 Corinthians 13, he is so gracious to give us clarity on what love is. It's a lot of things. It's patient. It's kind. It also does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. And so it is never loving to affirm someone's sin. That God who is love told us what marriage and gender is in the very first chapter of the first book of the Bible. That's how much it mattered. It's pre-civilizational, it's pre-cultural, it's pre-law. That means it cannot be subject to cultural whims or political definitions or social changes. It's rooted in creation that God made us male and female. The Bible, the Bible starts with a marriage. The Bible starts with a marriage and ends with a marriage. That's how important it is that we here on earth as husband and wife are an earthly reflection of the spiritual eternal marriage between Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride. Two men can't be that. Two women can't be that. That's how important it is. That's how central the definition of marriage is. I love it, amazing. Let's start lining up for questions. Um, also, can you uh, just throw up the QR code for the event tomorrow? I wanna make sure that's up there just for a little bit in case people need that. Um, let's start, we have, we have a good amount of time for questions. And just so you know, uh, Miss Rachel is very, very, I mean like incredibly popular. I mean, some of these videos have like 200 million views yeah. and they're for speech delayed young people, uh, for uh, like toddlers and, and stuff. Um, I'm sure a competitor is gonna emerge, but. Um, I hope, sure, hope so. And by the way, I, I've been told that there's other gay, like, little imagery that's in her videos, too. Oh, really? I haven't seen that. that that's what some people have been saying. Who knows? All right, we'll start, uh, we'll start right here. How are we doing, my man? Hey, I'm good. Um, so I was just wondering if you were going to be at the Trump thing tomorrow. I mean, I know it's not related, but I just really like... I, I, I'll see if I can fit into my schedule. <laughs> Uh, yes, I, 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 will be, I will be here bright and early, and um, yeah, just trying to make sure that we have organized chaos. So yes. Follow up to that, um, are you gonna be talking to him? Uh, I, I will be, yeah. <laughs> what would you, what would, if you could, what message should I bring to Mr. Trump? Say hi to me in the crowd. All right, <laughs> you got it. I love it. I will say for him, I will say to him though, please keep fighting, please keep fighting, please keep fighting. We have your back. I'm gonna tell him that. And um, I, I'm very biased, Ali knows this. I, I've known the family for a while, I know him very well. Uh, I think with the conviction, all of a sudden, people that might not have been political, they realize that this is such a violation of the normal American rules and customs of how we operate as a society. You do not get to use the legal system to make it harder for an opposition political candidate to challenge power. That is cheating. You do not, you're, you are not allowed to do that. And I, the entire election can be summarized in that. Immigration is important, economy is important, but just as a statement of principle, we will not put up with America becoming the third world, period. We will not allow that to happen. Okay, yes sir. Hi, this question is for Allie. My name is Jeff, and I'm not your normal demographic, but I'm a card-carrying related bro. So nice, thank, thank you. <laughs> love your podcast. So how do I ask this? Uh, I have a just turned 14 year old daughter, loves Jesus, straight A student, great girl, but is struggling with what you talked about uh, to let go of trying to center things around what she wants. Yeah. And all too often at home, it ends in frustration and emotions all over the place. Yeah. And we pray for her and we talk to her. She even knows the verse, if you, find, yeah, if you seek to find yourself, you'll lose it. But if you seek to lose yourself, you'll find it, and so forth. And we're, she's still struggling mightily with that. What suggestions do you have to encourage and help her with that? 
Yeah, you know, I only have experience as having been that teenage girl, not parenting that teenage girl. So I can't come from that uh, perspective. It does sound, yes, of course, it's sinful for anyone to center ourselves, but uh, it sounds like a lot of normal teenage girl stuff. And as long as it truly is a struggle, and this is true for all of us, and what I mean by that, when a lot of people say, oh, I'm struggling with this sin, are you struggling with that sin or are you just sinning and feeling bad about it? That's not a struggle. And so if she is actively trying through the grace of God to resist that selfishness, maybe even not in a legalistic way, but give herself goals of selflessness and charity and generosity and putting other people before herself every day. She is reading her Bible. She's surrounding herself with other godly girls and she is praying. I mean, that's the struggle of sin against sin that all of us are in right now, it just manifests itself in pretty wild ways when you're an emotional teenage girl. But you know what, Dad? You are doing a really good job. All right, so uh, Charlie, I know you're a little iffy on the college, uh, maybe being a scam or whatnot, but I wanna know, um, so next year I'm uh, attending Baylor University, a uh, private Christian conservative school. So I wanna know, like, what's the best advice you'd give me to not only succeed academically, but also with my faith? Sure, so why are you going to college? Um, I think uh, I'm very well with school, and, and uh, my parents have taught me that, and I think it's the best idea for me. I played sports in high school, but I just knew basketball like wasn't my money maker, so I think school is. And I just think it's gonna be a great uh, experience. No, no, cool, but why are you going to college? Uh, I think just for um, my job path and uh, to be in finance, I think okay, it's- Okay, cool. Good. Yeah, that's a good, so you're studying finance or business? So yeah, you don't need to go to college for that, but that's good, I'm, gl I'm glad, I, I, I hope, <laughs> ho hope it works out. Um, so Baylor's super woke, just so we're clear. It's not conservative, it's not Christian, like at all. Um, and they're increasingly LGBT, increasingly left wing. I'm giving you a hard time, because you're a guy, you could handle it if, you know. But to be honest, like, college is a total waste of time for most people. Um, you might meet a couple cool people. Um, maybe you'll meet your wife. Uh, it's a total scam. I hope you're not borrowing too much money. Um, no? Okay, good. So, but yeah, look, I think that, and I can say this from authority, I visited more college campuses in the last decade than any other person. We run a national college organization. Um, they make you take classes that have no application to your major. I'll tell you just one quick example. We have an intern that goes to Ohio State University. He has to now graduate another six months later than his original four years because they added all these new diversity classes. So he has to, ex he has to now go pay to go to class another six months for another $25,000 because of diversity, equity, inclusion, CRT. It, it, I cannot put into words how unnecessary college is for our best and brightest. Now, some, some can succeed, and again, I'm not trying to make you feel bad or like whatever, but um, look, make the most of it, and if you feel like it's a waste of time, just drop out. I mean, I, I know that sounds like, I know your mom's gonna like throw something at me or whatever, <laughs> but, but this is important, which is, and I, I, I will challenge every parent out there that might not like what I'm saying, which is, if you had to choose, this is actually a really good question for parents to ask your kid going to college. Ask your kid going to college, when I raised you, do you think I would prefer that you get a college degree or be a good person? And have your son or daughter answer that back to you. That would be a very interesting thing. And vast majority of kids will say, oh, my, my parents would much rather have me get a college degree. It is, it, college degrees are way more valuable in high society than being a person of good character or, you know. Again, one of the reasons I hate college is that it is a petri dish for the worst behavior, the worst actions, and the worst worldview. You become a worse person at most colleges. And again, it doesn't mean that you, can, you have to, but you're constantly surrounded by hookup culture, premarital sex, getting blackout drunk, drug usage, bad worldviews, deconstructionism. So what can you do? Join the Turning Point USA chapter is number one, right? Because uh, we are a hedge against those things. Um, and yeah, look, I, I know you might think that I'm being unfair to the college thing, but I think I have been rather vindicated this last year when we saw this Hamas garbage happening on campuses across the country. I'm just saying, and, and I, I, I say this with no exaggeration, that is just a taste. Now, if you are going to go, here's the cool thing. You can decide 
to become a better person, but it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of self-control of the Holy Spirit being like, I'm not gonna drink for four years. Like, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna have any alcohol. Like, that, that would actually make our college experience awesome. I'm gonna go spend extra time with professors. I'm gonna leverage this to meet the best alumni of Baylor and to become, th th by the way, the number one thing that college gets you is not knowledge, they don't teach you anything. It's connections or people, which again, you don't need college for that, but like it is learning from the alumni and getting the piece of paper so that people take you seriously. So anyway, that's my piece of advice. And then just being like, you know, meeting some rich people from Dallas and maybe their dads can hire you once you graduate. <laughs> Sorry if that was too blunt. This is kind of how I am. Hi, Charlie. My name's Kevin. And uh, by the way, happy birthday. And I've been here for the, the true last... birthday. You're right. I was like, well, it's not my birthday. Oh, yeah, it's true birthday. Yeah. For the last three years, I've missed about four of these nights. So I just want to say congratulations on your, your birthday. Allie, thank you very much for being here tonight. We've really appreciated your views. I have a personal friend. Oh, and I, by the way, I have a comment after the question. Uh, I have a personal. Really quick, my man. I have a personal friend who is raising a gay daughter. What would be the best advice you could give to me to bring it up in conversation to help him guide her in a different path, perhaps? Yeah, that can be a really difficult thing to navigate, especially as a friend. Um, there is this really good book. It's called Tactics by Greg Kokel. And something I love about this book is that he says, in every conversation that we have, we're getting the person closer to truth and closer to Christ. It's not that in every conversation we're trying to win the argument or that we're taking the ball into the end zone, I think that's the correct terminology, in every conversation. Um, you are inching them closer to the truth. And that means that you can start by asking him questions that make him think about it in a way that maybe he's never thought about it before. So have you talked to your daughter about this? What about this? Um, what do you think about when the Bible says this? If you ask him questions based on scripture and what God's word says about sexuality and the importance of raising our children in the Lord and admonishing them and what is right, what God says about sexuality, make him think about it a little bit more. See if he'll read a book that you suggest to him about someone, there's lots who used to live a gay lifestyle and then came to Christ and completely repented of that. There are a lot of ways that you can help push your friend towards Christ without alienating them right away because they might be offended. That's always a possibility. Um, but cultivating and planting those seeds and making him think, you never know how God is going to water and give growth to your efforts in pushing him towards what's true. Yeah, really quick, yeah. Briefly, Charlie, convey to 45 tomorrow that we've got his back. I will say that, thank you. And, and, and you guys showing up tomorrow will, will, will remind him of that, because this is his first public event tomorrow post-show trial conviction. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I just have two questions. Um, I know, like, uh, one thing that, like, really upset Jesus was when, like, people were selling stuff inside of the church. He, like, flipped over tables and stuff. How do you feel about like uh, people like selling their books and, and you know, kind of making a marketplace of the church, so you say? And also my second question would be, I know that like one of the big things he mentions over and over is idol worship and idol and idol and idol. Do you feel like um, like caffeine and social media are, are kind of like underlooked in the church community and like kind of n no one really like says anything about it or mentions it? They might like, mention it a little bit, but it's not very like, it's not spoken of as like an idol. It's, it's, it's such an interesting question. Uh, I'll let you do the marketplace. I was gonna I, say, I'll let you do that. <laughs> well, well for, no, I wanna talk about caffeine being an idol. Um, Cause if that's an idol, I got a lot of repenting to do. Um, I'll tell you what. Um, so yeah, look, I'll, I'll first say, um, I don't know how caffeine could become an idol. Uh, I actually think caffeine is a different type of drug because it actually at its best is used to make you more productive, which is why I have a lot of it. Um, in fact, I, I've had a, I'm actually on a 90-day caffeine fast because I had way too much caffeine for a long period of time. Um, you actually don't need caffeine as much as you think you do. Uh, but anyway, that's a separate issue. So I guess I'm yeah, I think that's how it can become an idol when you depend upon it for energy that you don't 
Like, I, you, I, I think you're like, totally I do right. that. I do that. Like, oh, I can't read my Bible until I have my coffee. And then sometimes you don't get around to reading your Bible because you just wanted the coffee. So I think sometimes it could become an idol. I, I, I will say, though, that the, the idol that is not talked about is gluttony in the church. That is legit. Uh, and that, that is the, the indulgence culture of food that is bad for you and lifestyles that defile the temple that God has given you, which is your body. That one I can agree with. As far as the marketplace, I mean, look, I, I will say that in certain circumstances, if you, if, you're, if you run a church and you're trying to like personally profit from it, then yeah, of course, obviously. But no, I, I have no problem with somebody that makes their living off of like selling a book or whatever, um, as long as it's done tastefully and voluntarily, I, I, I find no problem with that whatsoever. So. Yeah, and it also, he said, like, you've turned my house into a den of robbers. And so there was a lot of exploitation going on there, and it wasn't just commerce. It wasn't just simple supply and demand. There was exploitation of the poor, cheating that was going on there. The temple wasn't being used for the worship that it should have been used for. Like, I don't think it's wrong for a house of worship that is truly dedicated to worshiping the Lord, but... Like, there's also a, a bookstore there to sell books. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Van Patten. I'm taking over the Turning Point chapter at my school next year as a freshman. I'm extremely Christian and conservative and strong in my beliefs. However, I have a second cousin who's transgender. All my extended family supports them, and I have had multiple arguments with family members about it. How do I go about being loving toward them, but also standing firm in my beliefs? Um, how, how old is that individual? I am not sure. Right. I, like uh, under 18 or above 18? Above 18. Above 18, okay. Um, Allie, do you have a thought on, first on that? I have, I have several, but yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, I've had the I've had the privilege of interviewing a lot of detransitioners, and there's one. Her name is Laura Perry, and I won't tell her whole story, but she tried to live her life as a man for several years. There were lots of reasons why she thought that that would make her happy. She changed her body. She took hormones. She realized, okay this is just not working, but she had for a period of time alienated herself from her Christian conservative parents who would never call her Jake and would never call her he, him. And for a while she thought, well, they're just bigots. They're church or bigots and I don't wanna be around them. Well, the Lord ended up softening her heart. She ended up transcribing some Bible verses for her mom's Bible study. And while she was doing that, the Lord used his word as he does to start to convict her and to change her heart. And then long story short, she became a Christian. She has an amazing testimony. She's married now. Of course, she's living as what she always has been a woman. But what she says when she shares her testimony is that the first people that she went to after her conversion and after she realized she had to detransition were the people that always called her Laura, were the people that never wavered, the people that never affirmed the deceit in her life. The people that affirmed her deceit are the people who helped her ruin, I don't wanna say ruin her body, but irreversibly change her body. But it was her parents and that conservative evangelical church that never wavered, that always said, you're a woman made in the image of God. Those were the people she went to. So for now, you might be the family member that everyone says, ugh, she just doesn't get it. She is just ignorant, she is just backwards, she's a bigot, and that can be hurtful. I don't wanna minimize that. But I promise you, you standing for truth is one, obedience to God, that's what matters, end of story. But two, God will use your obedience, I promise you. I don't know how and I don't know when in this person's life. It might be 50 years. He or she might look back and say, you are the only one that stood for me. So keep standing strong. First, love that you're running the Turning Point chapter. That's amazing. Uh, secondly, I will say this, that I do not believe that someone is actually transgender. I don't believe that's a thing. I know that is a provocative view, but it is, it is rooted in the, the Bible, it's rooted in scripture, and it's rooted in biology. What do I mean? I mean that the person might think they are something that they are not, but they do not become the other thing just because you think the thing. The ramifications of accepting transgenderism as normative identification is civilizational ending. Yeah. 
It is you can choose your age, you could change your, choose your race, you can choose your income level, you could choose whatever you want based on mental status. So there has, uh, Dr. Miriam Grossman, who was here, I encourage you to re-listen to that uh, podcast. It was amazing when she was here. She said it great, which is that there's almost never a case of somebody that has transgenderism that does not have underlying, undiagnosed bipolar schizophrenia, depression, generalized, generalized anxiety disorder, or other issues alongside of it. So transgenderism, most times, 99.9% .9 of the time, is a symptom. So for example, if Ali all of a sudden says, I have a fever, that tells us nothing. She could have a bacterial infection, she could have COVID, she, her appendix might burst. She, there's like 500 different reasons why human beings break into a fever. So transgenderism is a fever, it is a symptom. And so we are trying to treat a symptom without actually going to the root cause, which unfortunately, American medicine is all about symptom management and not trying to get to root causes far too often. That's a systemic problem across the board. So thank you so much. This question's for Allie. I like her delivery a little better, but if Charlie Soft, he can... I got two daughters. I, I, no offense daughters. taken. Okay. When, when, two daughters. When, 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 when you need to go storm the city, you know, call me. So. All right. I got two daughters, both career women, and they have dogs. And as a father, I've tried to get into the conversation. I was wondering if on your relatable website, if you've got any material, or maybe you can just role play some reason for me to break into that subject matter without yeah. getting them angry with me. You mean they have dogs that they use as replacement for children? Yes. Yes, so this is a very sensitive conversation and because <laughs> women, young people, do not realize that they are channeling their natural biological urge for children into plants and pets. Um, they don't realize that. They think, oh no, this is just an amazing dog and I just love this dog so much, this is my baby. No, the reason why you're so attached to that dog is because you're supposed to be having a baby right now. Your biology is telling you that. Now again, I'm not saying that every single woman in that situation has chosen that. I'm not saying that, but many have. And that's why they get defensive because this has become their baby. It has, neurologically, like that's, that's what's going on there. And so that is a difficult conversation. Obviously, you gotta start with finding the right man. And then marriage, if you're talking about wanting them to have children, I think that's, I think that's what you're saying. Do you need to clarify? Am I wrong? You're both married. Oh, they are both married. Oh, sorry, I missed that. I missed that portion. Okay, well, that's a whole bigger issue. And so then their husbands are not leading very well. And as much as I know you as an awesome dad want to step in and say, oh, don't you want to have kids? At the end of the day, their husbands need to be the ones to step up and to make that decision. Not that I'm not trying to just hawk my book, but this is something I talk about in my book. It's called You're Not Enough and That's Okay, Escaping the Toxic Culture of Self-Love. Um, and I wrote it a few years ago, and we talk about that. Replacing babies with pets and plants, it's a huge problem. What venue are you on? Rumble, YouTube? Yeah, you can listen to my, well, it's on YouTube. You can watch it on YouTube and you can listen to it. Um, wherever you listen to podcasts and you can get the book wherever you buy books. Um, President Trump was gracious enough a couple years ago to come on the show. And um, so that was fun. Maybe my most fun guest ever, if I do say so, so. You gotta do it again. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, um, I am standing in for Native Americans all over the United States. And I do have a question. Um, well, two, but I'll just do one. Um, so how can us um, children of God or people who go to Native Americans that go to church um, be influential and encouraging to other Native Americans on the reservation, especially the Navajo Nation, because it's the, one of the biggest parts of um, Arizona, and their votes are very important to whoever is um, going to be elected in, in the Arizona state. Um, to become, it's very hard for Native American women, there's a stronghold on that of becoming submissive wives and 
being um, loving and you know gentle and caring mothers just because a generational of abuse and a lot of mothers there they come from um, for me um, I'm the only one who's saved in my family so I don't have a mother um, figure to look up to who um, can love their child the way God would want to and Dream City has been a big influence on my life <laughs> I'm, I'm thankful and um, so what would you what can how can we become more influential on the reservation as mothers and as um, leaders in political ways? Okay. Well, first, God bless you. It's so un unbelievably important. And um, I would love to visit Apache County. I, I learned that. Navajo Nation's in Apache County, not in Navajo County. It's an interesting thing. Um, I, I'd love to have visit and do some stuff. First of all, um, it, it, let's just make sure this, this is mentioned. Number one, um, community with a lot of addiction, right, and a lot of problems. And so only Jesus Christ can set the Native Americans free from that addiction and that cycle of addiction. And so you must be relentless in sharing that. Um, number two, uh, there is still a lot of paganistic folklore that exists in, you know, Native backgrounds. And so the, Christianity is against a lot of that paganistic folklore, and which is why you say, you know, the, the only one that's saved. Um, but look, the, I, I see a huge movement in traditionally left-wing populations, Native American, Hispanic, black communities that are increasingly open um, to the conservative message. This is, an, this is a difficult thing to communicate, but Native American reservations are, are by far some of the most messed up places in America. And it's largely because of government policies, of subsidizing the worst behavior, of massive amount of social welfare state. And if you want the real tragedy, it's we mistreated the native population legitimately 150 years ago. Like there's no spin, like just the way it is. And now we've continued to mistreat them in the name of compassion the last 100 years. Is that Native Americans deserve better than nonstop government programs and addiction and welfare pro it's so I don't know how it is. One of the hardest things is to convince people that are not free that they should pursue liberty. And I'm sure you live amongst that every single day. I visited a lot of reservations. They're, they're very depressing. I'm just, I'm sorry. They're, they're, they're wonderful people, but the amount of addiction, broken families uh, is, is very hard to witness. So we'd love to, to work with you and um, keep on spreading the gospel and the good news. So God bless you. Thank you. We'll take a couple more, okay? Yeah. Hey, first I wanted to say I love both of you guys' platforms. I've been a solid relator bro for a good year and a half. Thank you now. so much. Uh, what I wanted to ask is what is your best advice for a young Christian, strongly conservative teen boy to, not to, 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 to stay strong in my beliefs and not you know, stray away to the left and you know, become an atheist despite pushback from any you know, future hypothetical friends or just pressure I might face graduating high school in a couple years? I would say one of the most important things, so I did go to college. I'm not recommending going to college, but I did go to college, and Charlie is 100% right about college. By the way, I learned everything I need to know. Like, by 12th grade, it was just a few connections that I'm thankful for, and then I ended up meeting my husband from that, so that was worth it. But the thing that kept me sane, that kept me from becoming a communist in college, was immediately surrounding myself by like -mind, with like-minded people, immediately joining a local church, immediately joining a Bible study, immediately joining the campus ministry, immediately getting to know a variety of Christian families in the city who I started babysitting for. All of those people and the structure that they created around my life and holding me count accountable and keeping me solid, like there's so much power in looking around and realizing, oh, I'm not the only one. That's what I would say. You have to surround yourself with people that are godlier than you are, that are stronger than you are, that are more sure about their faith and their belief system than you are so that they can sharpen you as iron sharpens iron. So... It doesn't have to be 10 friends. It can just be one solid friend. But try as much as you can to avoid isolation and surround yourself by people who make you better. Thank you.
and, and join the local Turning Point chapter. Yes, ma'am. We'll, we'll, we'll do uh, one more here, one more there. So we'll do three more. Okay, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Sydney. Um, I'm getting a lot of college questions, but I plan on attending Grand Canyon University in the fall. Um, I understand how it's a little bit of a touchy subject, especially in the conservative world. Um, I was wondering if both of you would speak into this, because what I'm struggling with with college is that it's, I'm told a lot by conservative media, by Christians, that it's not necessary for you, your spiritual growth, your professional growth, but no one will hire me without a college degree. And I say this not try, like I, I've tried. So I actually applied for a Turning Point internship and I was told that I had to either be in my second year of college or an equivalent. And so it's hard to do anything. And I hope this doesn't come across as argumentative. Who, who told you that? I was, <laughs> um, I was told to check back again and then the internship process told me I couldn't well, Was apply. that for hiring or internship? Um, it, it was, was probably internship. It was an right? internship well, just, on your website. Yeah, just apply for a job. So yeah. <laughs> we, we, the, the founder didn't go to college. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's just been really hard for yeah. me because I've been told I'm not yet old enough or I don't have the experience or people won't hire yeah. me without like the work ethic that they know yeah. I have if I have a degree. So it's, I'm going through this process and I'm, I'm not saying I'm not looking forward to it because I believe college has a lot of things to offer, especially because I'm going. My dad's a pastor in the area, so I already, I'm very grounded in my faith. I'm very grounded. I have a great group of friends who are also Christians. So that's not what I'm going for. I'm just being told I can't progress in my life without a college degree by people who say that college is bad. So I don't really know where to go. Yeah, next. so I mean, look, I, I'll, someone's gonna get handled. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I was doing. So no, um, but so let me ask you a question. Uh, what, what's more important, uh, happy, healthy family or career for your life? Oh, family. All okay, cool. Way. So, so, so you're, you're if you, so in college, just, you know, if you want to find a husband, that's a great place to do that. Um, potentially, and honestly, it's probably worth it because a lot of people can't find husbands. So getting an MRS degree is totally legit. Um, no, I'm totally like, no, I'm not, I'm not diminishing that, by the way. If you say I'm going to college to find a husband, like I totally respect that. Like absolutely worth $150,000, like absolutely. Um, no, think, I'm, right, Allie, like that's not a joke. Like, I mean, finding your life partner, like of course you should go into debt for that, absolutely. But it, look, it's just a lie. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. Um, it depends on what you want to do. People will hire you. And again, I'm just, I, I'm so out on the college thing because it's such non-creative thinking. They, they don't teach you wisdom. They don't teach you actually worldliness. They kind of, they just treat you like a cog in a wheel. And again, so I, I, I what, what do you want to do? I plan on going into the ministry, which okay. people usually think is you don't need college for it, but honestly, no one will hire you. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's just not true, changing. but yeah, that, that's just not true. I think it's changing. I think it's changing, but I feel you. That's, I mean, basically why I went to college, because everyone just went to college, and that's what she did, and that is how I got my job that I then was able to meet my husband from that. So I feel you, but I do think, I don't know how quickly it's gonna change, but I do think employers, at least in our sphere, Christian conservative sphere, are looking less and less at degrees and more, are you smart? Do you think critically? Are you trustworthy? Do you have a good attitude? Those are the four things that I look for when I'm looking for someone to hire, so. Thank you. See, she might hire you. Thank you. Hey, uh, Pastor Angel told me to take the mic. Uh, we have a college here that's not a scam. Uh, it's connected to Southeastern University. So if anybody has questions, they can find me after. Um, we teach our students not just biblical truths and everything, but also just how to be really good people in this community. We teach biblical values, no woke stuff. So it is a good option, especially for you if you wanna go into ministry. Thanks. Uh, here and then he'll be the final. We'll go, yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, so as we become less woke, everyone started to turn against our views on marriage. Me and my best friend firmly believe in marriage and believe it's the best thing for women. Do you think it's smart that we full send, get married, and have a bunch of kids, or if we just got out of high school? If, if, if you just got what out of high school. was the last part? Yeah, if you just got a high school. Oh yeah, no, have as many kids as, as early as you possibly can. Absolutely, yeah. no. 
Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, tr true wealth is how many, how many children you have or how good your relationship is with them. I mean, and look, I know that might sound really radical, but I've been radicalized by the amount of people that did not prioritize family formation and they delayed and they delayed and they delayed. And again, the most beautiful stories I hear are from families that they had more kids than they could afford and they extend themselves a little bit. And in that insanity and that chaos, they're formed very, very close together. And so, yeah, look, it might not be financially easy, but you have to answer a question. Do you want to live a simple life or a deep life? And if you want to live a deep life, that involves having children and getting married. Um, and again, for those of us that have kids, it is not easy. You know, Allie has three, we have two. Uh, you want to also, you want that self-love narcissism to die? Have children. Yeah. That, that murders self-love narcissism, yeah. right? Like very quickly. And it was like self-love, like, okay, have two kids under the age of two and go give yourself like a nice mental hug or whatever weird Buddhist thing you're doing. And so, yeah, look, I... Again, I might that sound like radical advice, but have at least, you know, have a couple kids and then see how that works. But it, it's the most amazing thing and do it while you can. I think it's really important. And children are a gift from the Lord, as it says in Proverbs. And we're, we, 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 would, we would both totally agree with that. So thank you. Yes, this will be the, uh, the final question. Hi, my name is Braxton Insanius and I have two questions. One is, how do I get closer to God? What are some tips how to get closer to God? How old are you, by the way? 11. Amazing. I'll give it up for that. It's not easy to do to get up there. Sure. Do you have a Bible? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I do. So I would get you, like, when I, I don't know if y'all had, like, the NIV New Adventure Bible growing up? Was anyone born in the 90s that had that? Yes, it was the best. And so get you a good translation that's easy to read, that's easy to understand. I even like listening to the Bible on an app. Sometimes I'm just busy. That might be something that you like to do. Prayer and reading your Bible, those are two of the best ways to get closer to God. Make sure that you're going to, if I don't know if you're going to this church or not, but if you go to this church, that's great. Make sure that you've got uh, older uh, men or uh, older boys who are older than you, who are discipling you, who are mentoring you, and who are teaching you what's good, right, and true. Um, yeah, make sure that you're plugged into the local church and to people who can influence you well. I would say those three things. Yeah, and so there's, it's such a great question. The earlier you can learn how God designed you to get closest to God is really important. And everybody has a different answer to this. Some people get closest to God in prayer. Some people get closest to God in Bible study. That's certainly me. When, when I start to see the beauty of the scriptures using reason, I, 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 I freak out. I love it. I'm like, wow, just it, the, the beauty of it. Other people get closest to God in worship of music and listening to worship music, which is very, very biblical. Other people get closest to God through acts of service. So through helping other people or volunteering, other people get closest to God by going to church. However, the last thing I'll say is this, is that this is, this is not taught in most churches. You have to choose and decide to want to get close to God. That it, he sometimes does come into your life unexpectedly, that is legitimate, but it, you can't count on that. It must be a discipline. You must pursue him and to seek him. So the sooner and the younger that you can realize that, the better. Thank you, my man, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, uh, any closing thoughts, Allie? Uh, ways people can support you or follow your work? Um, sure, it's relatable wherever you listen to your podcast or you can watch. I've got a new book coming out, but I haven't announced it yet, so I'm not allowed to say what it's called, although I said it a few times tonight already. And I've got that other book, You're Not Enough, and that's okay. I've also got, if you are a woman, I don't even have to define that. Everyone in this room knows what that is. Uh, we have something called the Share the Arrows event. That's September 28th in Dallas, Texas. We've got Francesca Battistelli, Rosaria Butterfield, Elisa Childers, lots of other speakers, and it's Christian women coming together and empowering one another with the truth of God's word and the craziness of our culture. 
can go to sharethearrows.com and see more about that if you'd like. But thank y'all so much. Great questions and great energy in the room too. Thank y'all so much for welcoming us. We will see you guys tomorrow. If you, Please make plans to be there bright and early tomorrow. Have that godly patience. Let's do a show of force for President Trump. See you guys tomorrow morning.